You can be seated. How many of you have ever seen or heard of the show called Fixer Upper? Anybody in here ever heard of Fixer Upper? All right. Many of you have. Maybe some of us have a Fixer Upper on our hands now after this past week. But the show is about this couple who in the Waco area spend time going into these older homes that need to be remodeled, need to be redone. And there's this iconic defining moment right in the show where they have a, a big board of what the house used to look like and they open it up and show people what the new home looks like. It's a really, really exciting show. It was on the air for several years. What Jesus is doing in this passage is he's telling you and I that we are fixer-uppers. He's telling us that in the same way that we'd walk into a house and see quickly the things that need to be repaired and need to change, that humanity as a whole is in need of desperate change and transformation. Jesus has been talking to people in public. He's performed miracles in public. He's uh, cleansed the temple. But in chapter three, we, the camera kind of zeroes in, zooms in on a private conversation Jesus has with a man named Nicodemus. Now, the Jews have tried to silence Jesus publicly. That hasn't worked. And so they send Nicodemus as this kind of representative from their group to try to challenge him. And what we know about Nicodemus is that he was the right challenger for Jesus, at least in the Jewish community's eyes. On the one hand, Nicodemus was incredibly popular. He came from a very prominent, wealthy family. And historical records even suggest that he was a war hero, that he'd fought in wars. And so he was well known in the Jewish community. He was also very powerful. The text before us says that he was from the ruling class of the Jews. He was from the Sanhedrin, which was this ruling group that controlled much of Jewish life and their affairs. But he was also a very passionate man. He's described as of the Pharisees. That means he was not just an Easter and Christmas Jew. He was a very weakly devoted, passionate man to the Jewish religion. But one of the things I want you to notice in your Bible is that what it says in verse 1, look back at the text. It says, there was a man from the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. This man came to him at night and said, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one can perform these signs you do unless God were with him. John describes Nicodemus twice as a man. Now that should catch our attention because we don't need help understanding that he's a man. We know that he's a human, that he's a male based on how he's described here. Why does John emphasize that he's a man? Remember at the end of chapter two, John told us that Jesus knew what was in humanity. He knew it was in mankind. There was this sinfulness, this darkness that was in them. And so he's, he's described Nicodemus as a man to tell us that the way Jesus is going to interact with Nicodemus sets him up as not just a Jewish representative, but as a representative of the human race. Therefore, what Jesus has to say to Nicodemus, he also has to say universally to you and to me. The way Jesus is going to interact with Nicodemus, especially as John tells us he comes in the darkness of night, reminds us that Nicodemus wasn't just coming in the literal night, though he was. There's also symbolism to what John is telling us. Nicodemus is in the dark and Jesus is going to help show him the light. Nicodemus does approach Jesus with what appears to be respect. I read it a minute ago. Let's look at it again. Verse two, Rabbi, we know that you are a teacher who has come from God for no one could perform these signs you do unless God were with him. Now this starts the first of three challenges Nicodemus throws down with Jesus. This first challenge, Nicodemus treats Jesus as his inferior. Nicodemus is coming into this with more social standing, with more popularity, at least at this point. And he's coming, treating Jesus as an inferior rabbi. And so while he calls him rabbi and treats him with a measure of respect, the way he addresses Jesus falls woefully short of declaring who Jesus really is, the Messiah. But what's underneath this is Nicodemus is trying to corner Jesus into a particular box. He's trying to paint a box around Jesus so that he's nothing more than a special rabbi. And so there's a level of authority and evaluation Nicodemus is trying to put on Jesus. Notice how Jesus responds. Verse three, Jesus replied, truly I tell you, unless someone is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. What Jesus does right out of the gate is he rejects Nicodemus's interpretation and evaluation. 
of him. And he asserts a different kind of authority and evaluation. And so essentially he says to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, you're not qualified to evaluate me unless you've experienced what he calls as being born again. You can't see the kingdom. You can't taste the grace and mercy of God unless you've experienced this new birth. Now that new birth he's talking about is a radical transformation that comes from above and it's something that happens to us subsequent to our lives in this world. It doesn't happen at birth. It happens after we're born. And what Jesus is saying very clearly to Nicodemus is, Nicodemus, I know you think I'm inferior to you, but the reality is unless you've experienced this rebirth, this transformation, you have no business evaluating me. In a sense, what Jesus is saying is, he's no ordinary rabbi. Jesus refuses to be painted in a corner and to be made out to be nothing more than a teacher. He's asserting his divine God authority. He's saying, I'm in a whole other class by myself. I'm not a rabbi that you can just treat as inferior and push away. I'm the son of God. In 1999, there was a tornado that blew through Oklahoma that clocked in over 300 miles an hour. 300 miles an hour. And it was classified as an F5 tornado. But the reality is most F5 tornadoes don't get above 200 miles an hour, 250 miles an hour. And so as this thing exceeded 300 miles an hour, while they put it in the F5 classification, the reality is it really needed another category all on its own because of its wind speed. This is what Jesus is doing with Nicodemus. He's saying, listen, I'm in a category all by myself. I know you think I'm just another rabbi. I know you're trying to paint me in the corner as just another teacher of the word of God, but I'm actually much more than that. Nicodemus recognizes that Jesus is pushing back And as he challenges him the second time, in verse 4, he treats him less like an inferior and more like a peer. Notice your Bible is how he does this. How can anyone be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked him. Can he enter his mother's womb a second time and be born? Nicodemus is focused on the human elements to what Jesus is saying. He's focused on the human activity that goes into what his idea would be of a rebirth. But his answer betrays a kind of confusion and some moderate opposition to Jesus. He's really not buying what Jesus is saying. He's pushing back. But at this point, he recognizes Jesus is not below him. He's trying to treat him more like a peer. Jesus, although, doubles down in his answer. Look at verse 5. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, unless someone is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Whatever is born of the flesh is flesh. And whatever born of the Spirit is spirit. Do not be amazed that I told you that you must be born again. The wind blows where it pleases and you hear its sound, but you don't know where it comes from or where it's going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. Jesus doubles down to tell him two more things about this transformation. He says, number one, Nicodemus, this is a radical transformation. The transformation you need is a cleansing transformation. That's why he talks about water. But it's also a spirit transformation. This is talking about the whole of Nicodemus. He's saying, Nicodemus, you need a transformation of your entire life. But he also tells him that this radical transformation is only brought about by the spirit. It's a spirit-led transformation. When he uses the word flesh here, he's not using it in the way Paul uses it, which uses about sinful humanity. He's just talking about the human body. He's saying, look, humans can accomplish this transformation. Only the spirit can accomplish that. But Nicodemus, no more can you control the wind or manipulate the wind that you see blowing through the world than you can control the spirit. The spirit moves where it will. It does what it wants. You can't control it or manipulate it. You need a radical transformation that only God can bring. Here's the point. Jesus wants Nicodemus to know that this radical transformation is something that's beyond his authority or ability. He wants him to know that this transformation is not something that his first birth can deal with, that he has to have a second birth. See, part of what Jesus is pushing back against Nicodemus is this idea that as a Jew, he was acceptable to God based on his birth. There was this theory going around in this current day that because he was Jewish, that God had a special kind of grace or special kind of love for the Jewish nation that wasn't extended to others. And while the Jewish nation was important to God's plans and purposes, their Jewish nationality and their heritage did not save them. And so Jesus pushes back to say, listen, the kind of transformation you need, not only does your first birth not deal with it, it's not just like you need a little help. 
You need total transformation in your life. Going back to those fixer-upper shows, they never walk into those houses going, you know, I love this paneling from the 1970s. This old carpet, the mold on the wall, the paint that looks like it's from the 1950s. I love this way it looks, honey. Don't you? We should just move right in. No, when they walk into Fixer Uppers, they go, this place has got problems. It needs a total transformation. This is what Jesus is saying about humanity. He doesn't walk into our lives going, you know what? I think I'll just add a little wing to your life. And you can have a little compartment for Jesus in your life. He says, no, you're going to need a total and complete transformation. Well, at this point, Nicodemus realizes he's not just dealing with a peer. He's dealing with somebody who's superior to him. Now watch this. First challenge, he started by treating Jesus as an inferior. Second challenge, he tried to treat him as a peer. But by the third, he basically rolls up the white flag and realizes, Jesus, you're superior to me. Look at what he says in verse 9. He just says, how can these things be? How could this happen? It's like he's just got one more swing left before he falls on the mat there. He says, I don't even understand what you're talking about. And so as Nicodemus has walked through this progression, Jesus, in verses 10 through 15, gives kind of a victory monologue. He just asks Nicodemus to listen. And he does two things as he shares with Nicodemus. On the one hand, he rebukes him. He rebukes him. Look at verse 10. Are you a teacher of Israel and don't know these things? Jesus replied. Truly, I tell you, we speak what we know and we testify to what we have seen, but you do not accept our testimony. If I've told you about earthly things and you don't believe, how will you believe if I tell you about heavenly things? In verse 7, Jesus had told Nicodemus, don't be amazed at what I'm telling you. Don't be surprised. And here he brings this truth home. He says, listen, if you knew your Old Testament, you would know that that's exactly what I told you was going to happen. If you read the Old Testament, Nicodemus, and really were aware of what I promised, you would know the truth. And the truth is that in Ezekiel, in the book of Jeremiah, God promised that one day he would give the people a new heart and his spirit would live within them. And he's going, Nicodemus, if you knew the Old Testament, if you knew what the Bible actually taught, you would know that this is something I promised. And because you don't get that, if I can't explain these basic earthly things to you, why would I go beyond that into greater detail? Said another way, if I can't explain algebra to you, there's no point in me explaining calculus. That's that earthly things, heavenly things coming on. But the root of what Jesus confronts Nicodemus with is that he is rejecting his authority. Did you see verse 11? We speak what we know and we testify to what we've seen, but you do not accept our testimony. Nicodemus rejects the authority of Jesus. He understands some of the concepts, He's aware of what Jesus is talking about. At the end of the day, he rejects his authority. This is important for our cultural climate because there is a uh, problem we're facing in our culture with understanding how authority works. There is a allergy people have to authority. In our culture, we hear people say, well, who says marriage should just be between a man and a woman? Who says gender is binary? Who says that life starts at conception? There's this this kind of resistance to authority in our culture. And what we hear people saying a lot, and if you've heard this phrase once, you've heard it a thousand times over the last year, is we have to follow the science. How many of you have ever heard that phrase? We've got to follow the science, okay? Let me clarify something for you. Science can tell you what is. It cannot tell you what ought to be. When somebody says follow the science, you should start listening very carefully because there's a set of values and assumptions and presuppositions someone's appropriating to make sense of what we should do in light of the data that's there. My point is simply this. We need to be clear about what we're saying about authority. We do believe the Bible is our authority, but especially to the younger people in the room and listening online, don't buy the lie that you cannot be intellectual and believe the Bible is your authority. What we're seeing in our culture today is deception about this idea that science is our authority when the reality is science is not driving most of these decisions at all. There's a set of values and presupposition about what society is supposed to look like, what we're supposed to be as a culture that's driving what we're doing and what we're not doing. My point is simply this. We believe the authority of Jesus found in God's word is what we're going to live our lives on. We believe these presuppositions, these assumptions, these values should shape how we look at the world and how we make decisions. We're not going to apologize for that. 
Jesus moves from talking about this authority and rebuking Nicodemus for rejecting that to also talking about his victory, though. Verses 13 through 15, he lays out his victory. Look at verse 13 with me. No one has ascended into heaven except the one who is descended from heaven, the Son of Man. Just as Moses lifted up the snake in the wilderness, so the Son of Man must be lifted up so that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus first in verse 13 talks about his position as the son of God. He's come from heaven because he is God. He's God in the flesh. But he's descended for a purpose. And the purpose that he's descended for, he uses an illustration from the Old Testament to describe what that purpose is. And he talks about a point in Israel's history where they were rebelling against God and God sent snakes all throughout the nation of Israel's camp that began to bite them and kill them. The people of Israel begin to cry out in the Old Testament asking for help. God tells Moses, make a bronze serpent, put it on a stick, hold it up in the middle of the camp. And he says, listen, when the people are bit and they begin to die, if they look at this bronze statue, I will heal them immediately. Using this son of man title from the Old Testament, pulling all the Old Testament in from, from into this promise, Jesus says, listen, in the same way that that bronze serpent was lifted up and it healed the people, I'm gonna need to be lifted up so that everyone who looks at me by faith will be healed. He ends by saying, look, Nicodemus, this new birth, this transformation that you need, I'm the only one who can give it to you. It's only when you trust me, Nicodemus, that you're really going to experience the healing and forgiveness and the new birth that you need. And so here's the principle. This is the point I want you to write down if you're taking notes, okay? Our Savior's exaltation brings spiritual transformation. Our Savior's exaltation, him being lifted up through his cross and his resurrection, that exaltation is the only way you and I can experience the transforming work that he's promised in this passage. You and I need to walk through the same path, though, that Nicodemus walked if we're going to experience it. See, we enter this world just like Nicodemus, thinking that God's inferior to us. We may not act that way. We may not go out and say that. But we live our lives functionally like we're the kings of our universe, like we're the main character of our story. So we enter this world like Nicodemus here in this passage, thinking God's our inferior. The only way we experience the Savior's work in our life, the only way we experience his transformational work in our life is when we believe that he really is the exalted, where we move from being we're seeing God as our inferior to seeing him as superior to us. When I was growing up, we went on several vacations to Gulf Shore, Alabama. Anybody ever been to Gulf Shore, Alabama in here online? Beautiful, beautiful beach, beautiful place to go. But when I was seven or eight years old, we were headed down there and a tropical storm blew through Gulf Shores, Alabama. And I don't know why I remember this, just certain things you remember as a kid, but I remember the wind blowing so hard that my dad could not get the door open of the car. He had to like kick the door open to get it because it was blowing so hard. Because of the tropical storm that we couldn't stay where we were planning to stay. So we had to go down the road and we had to do this really weird thing called pull over and ask for directions. Does anybody remember pulling over and asking for directions in here? Anybody remember that? Online people, you may remember what it was like to do that. Some of these have been around for a while. But I remember my parents having to stop several times and pull over and ask for help. And I remember a couple times my dad not wanting to do that. I don't know if you remember those days because you were kind of having to admit you were lost or you didn't know where you were going. Because to pull over is to acknowledge you have a problem you can't solve yourself, Right? What Jesus calls Nicodemus to do and what he calls us to do in this passage is to pull over. He calls us to pull over and admit that we cannot bring about the radical transformation that we need. He calls us to roll up the white flag as Nicodemus finally did in this passage and say, Jesus, I believe you as the exalted one are the only one, the only one who can change me from the inside out. Now, believers, I want you to know something. Those of you listening online or in person, if you're a follower of Jesus, pulling over, spiritually speaking, is not something you just do when you first come to Christ. I believe pulling over and asking for God's grace and help and mercy is something we're called to do every single day. I don't know if you found this to be the case this past week or last couple weeks or even last year. 
but it's very easy to face a lot of problems without ever stopping and asking God for help. It's very easy to go through problem after problem in your life and never really stop and pull over and say, God, I desperately need you. The primary and the practical way you and I pull over as Christians is we stop and we pray. Prayer is spiritually pulling over and saying, God, help me. And what I would just appeal to each of you to recognize as believers is that every one of us need to pull over about every single responsibility God's given us. We need to be pulling over about our marriages. When's the last time you pulled over and said, God, would you please help me as a husband, as a wife, to be the husband or wife you've called me to be? When's the last time you've pulled over as a parent? God, would you please help me be the parent you've called me to be because I can't change the hearts of my children. Only you can. When's the last time you pulled over in your career or your calling and said, God, I want to be retired for the glory of God. I want to serve as a doctor or a teacher or a nurse for your glory. God, would you please help me do that today? When's the last time you've pulled over? My concern for you is, is it's easy to go days into weeks into months without ever really stopping and pulling over and saying, God, you're the only one that can really change and transform my life and the people around me. When's the last time you pulled over about somebody who's lost in your life that you're broken for, somebody who doesn't know Christ? When's the last time you pulled over and quit ranting about a situation on your own, quit batting around and just said, I'm gonna get on my knees and ask God to move powerfully? Jesus, as our exalted Savior, is the only one who can bring transformation. We must pull over and ask him desperately for help. What John has shown us very clearly in this passage so far is that our Savior's exaltation is how we experience this new transformation. But what he does in verses 16 through 21 as he finishes this passage is he gives us some inspired commentary. Now, it's my belief as your pastor that verses 16 through 21 are not the words of Jesus. I believe these are the words of John the Apostle. Now, in your Bible, some of your Bibles, you have red letter Bibles, and you'll see the red letters continuing through verse 21. That's a decision the editor of your Bible's made. In the original Greek language, there are no quotation marks. So you're left to context clues to figure out where do Jesus' words, words stop, where do John's words start? Well, we know from chapter 2, when Jesus cleansed the temple, he cleansed the temple, and then John gave three or four verses of commentary. We also see verses 16 through 21, Jesus being talked about a way that he doesn't normally use to talk about himself. And so in a similar way, if you've ever played sports and they pop in the tape to watch the game and you rewatch the game to see where things went right, things went wrong, it's as if in verses 16 through 21, John's popping in the tape and he's giving you a replay of what's happened and he's explaining through some commentary what he wants you to notice and see. There's at least two things that I think he wants you to see about the transformation Jesus brings in verses 16 through 21, okay? Two things I want you to notice. We're gonna put these on the screen. Number one, I think he wants us to see transform, the transformation's motive. I think he wants us to see the motive for God's transforming work in verses one through 15. Look at verses 16 and 17 for this motive. For God, this is John the Apostle talking, for God loved the world in this way, he gave his one and only son so that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. I have a, a Lord's Supper table in my study, in my office, that was given to me by my family. It was made because we had a family member who died. It was made in remembrance of that family member. My, my family helped plant a church in the Memphis, Tennessee area, and that table was used for their Lord's Supper for decades. And uh, when the church merged with another one, it came back to me. They gave it to me. The family gave it to me, and it's in my office. It is rare, unique, one of a kind. If it burns, there's never another one like it. God is saying that about his son. He's saying Jesus is this rare, unique, one of a kind person. He's the unique son of God. But the reason God is sending Jesus, notice what it says in verse 16, is because he loves the world. The reason God sent Jesus, the reason God is offering us this transformation is because he loves us. Now that doesn't mean that everyone is gonna be saved. He's not teaching universalism here. He talks about those who are gonna perish, you reject him, those who believe are gonna receive eternal life. He talks about condemnation and salvation. But he's clear 
that what Jesus offers, he offers out of love. Part of the reason that's so important is the new life that Jesus offers you is not just a drudgery or a duty. The new life Jesus offers you is an opportunity to experience his love. He talked about eternal life. That speaks to not just a quantity of life, but a quality to the life that Jesus gives us. Part of what you get when you experience the transforming work of Jesus is you get to enjoy the love of God forever. And there is nothing like recognizing you are loved. There is nothing like recognizing the God of the universe loves you and I, even in our sinfulness. I'll never forget the moment I knew I wanted Shelly to be my wife. I knew she was incredibly beautiful. <laughs> I knew that she was funny and we had some similar passions and interests. But the reason I ended up asking her to be my wife was because I genuinely enjoyed being around her. And I knew that as great as we looked in our 20s, we weren't always going to look that great. In the immortal words of Paul McCartney, like 64, right? I wanted to make, she would still love me when I turned 64 and that we could grow old together and that I would enjoy being around her for the rest of our lives. I wanted somebody that I could enjoy being with. And the good news of the gospel is the transformation God brings us into is into a relationship in which he loves us to the point that we can enjoy him, not just in this life, but in the next. You need this transformation that Jesus offers you because he offers you love and unconditional forgiveness and kindness. But it ends, this passage does end, not just with transformation's motive, it ends with transformation's warning. There's a warning that it ends on, and I want you to notice it. Verses 18 through 21 lays out this warning. He says, anyone who believes in him is not condemned, but anyone who do not, does not believe is already condemned because he has not believed in the name of the one and only Son of God. This is the judgment. The light has come into the world and the people love the darkness rather than the light because their deeds were evil. For everyone who does evil hates the light and avoids it so that his deeds may not be exposed. But anyone who lives by the truth comes to the light so that his works may be shown to be accomplished by God. Here's what Jesus is saying through John the apostle. This is John speaking, but I believe God's inspiring him to tell us this. He says, on the one hand, your sin has condemned you. You stand condemned because of your sin. Every one of us enter this world condemned. We stand guilty before God. But part of what's so dangerous about our guilt is that not only does it destroy us, he talks about darkness deceiving us, blinding us from the truth. So that just like a drug we keep coming back to that destroys us and kills us, sin is like that drug. It keeps bringing us back to it over and over again as it destroys us. And there's this allergy within this deception to the truth because if we step into the truth, it shines the light on our problem. He contrasts this with the truth. He says, listen, when people live in the truth, they gladly step into the light confessing that God has changed them. But when we live in darkness, we live in a sin that can deceive us and destroy us. Here's the point. Humans are not neutral beings. Humans do not enter this world morally neutral and then their environment pushes them either to good or to evil. What this passage clearly teaches is that humans are naturally predisposed to sin. We naturally lean into wanting to serve and worship ourselves. We naturally lean into the darkness that is this world. And what he wants to make clear is the only way that we're going to be changed is if God changes us from the inside out. What he's saying is we need Jesus to rewire us so that we move from wanting sin and darkness to wanting Jesus. The reason you need this transformation is apart from the transformation of Jesus, you can't stop wanting the sin in your life. You're enslaved to it. It's only when Jesus changes you that he rewires you and makes you a new creation. This past week, we, like so many other North Texans, had a pipe burst in our kitchen. And uh, gallons and gallons of water uh, were dumped into our kitchen. We were thankful that we were able to get a plumber to come out and check it out. And when they cut a hole in the ceiling of my kitchen, they found a spot in the pipe like this. No bigger than this. Some of you may not be able to see it from where you are, but there's a little hole right here in the pipe that dumped gallons and gallons and gallons of water. Now, what we know 
is that the house wasn't built with this hole in it. The house was built with the pipes working properly. It was only when the environment, the acute cold that we've been dealing with for the past week and a half, froze these pipes over and it busted. What I want you to understand is that we are not like this pipe. We do not enter the world with all of our pipes and our wirings functioning properly and then our environment causes a burst. We enter the world like this. We enter the world with busted pipes, with wiring going in the wrong direction, desperately in need of God's redemptive work in our lives. And what Jesus is telling us through this passage is the people of the light, people of the truth, when they come into the light, they don't strut into the light giving testimony to what they've done. They come into the light giving thanks for what God has done in their lives. The transformation you desperately need in your life is there because apart from Jesus, you cannot fix these busted pipes and and the wiring that's off in your heart. You need him to rewire you so that you want the right things. So here's the question I want to end on. Have you pulled over and admitted that you are a fixer-upper? Has has there been a moment in your life when you've admitted completely and totally that you desperately need God's grace and mercy? Earlier in this time together, I talked primarily to those of you that were believers. I was talking to Christians about needing to pull over and ask for God's help in our relationships and marriage. But just for a second, I want to talk to those of you that are not Christians And I want you to understand that the reason we believe you need the gospel of Jesus Christ is because you need a total transformation that you cannot accomplish on your own. We believe that the wiring and the plumbing in your heart and your life left to yourself is going to destroy you. Not just in this life, but especially in the next when you face the wrath and the justice of God in an everlasting hell. And the good news that we've sung about, talked about, and prayed about today is that though every one of us deserve God's justice and wrath in an everlasting hell, Jesus Christ came. He lived a perfect life. He died on the cross for your sins and rose again so that he could fix this stuff in your life. And this fixing doesn't happen overnight. It's a process that God brings about. But if you've never placed your faith and your trust in Jesus Christ, we're gonna put a phone number on the screen in just a second. We would love to have an opportunity to talk with you, whether you're online or in person. If you'd like to have somebody pray with you, talk with you, encourage you, uh, we would love an opportunity to do that. Uh, We believe this transformation Jesus offers is something you need, and we as a church would love to connect with you, talk with you about how you can experience that. So if you've never experienced that, if you've ever crossed the line of faith, we'd love to have that conversation with you. If you text that number, we'll respond to you. We've got people standing by watching that that would love to do that. But as we close this morning, as we sing and give praise to God, let's remember that our Savior's exaltation, his death and glorious resurrection is the only thing, is the only thing that brings real spiritual transformation. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you. Even in these unique circumstances that we're dealing with today, Lord, that God, you are still sovereign, you're still on your throne. And Jesus, that what you offer us is real, lasting, spiritual transformation. God, I pray that in a way that only you can, if there are people here watching online or in the room that don't know you, that God, you would open the eyes of their heart, you would show them the truth of what you've done and accomplished for them, the spiritual transformation you offer. And Jesus, that you would draw them to yourself and save them. God, I pray for believers in the room that we'd be quick to pull over in our lives, that we'd be quick to stop and pray, calling out to you because we know that you're the only one that brings real change. And God, as we do that, as you said in verse 21, we wanna give you all the glory and the honor and the praise. God, be honored and glorified as we close this time of worship. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.